love to hear those special words coming out of the Lord. Oh, yeah, me too. Welcome everyone to our service at First Presbyterian Church this morning. It is a joy to see all of you and to welcome you into the sanctuary or visiting with us online. Thank you for taking part in this service with us. We've come to worship God, to give praise to God and thanks for all of the blessings of life, the blessings all around us. And so together we will give thanks and praise. Today is a special day, as you may already note. We have many young people sitting down front who will be taking part in the service today. And it is a, a true inspiration to hear the ancient words and the newer words, but all of the words, the sacred words, coming out of the mouths of these beautiful young people. So I hope that it blesses you mightily today. We will also welcome to the pulpit Reverend Chase Caldwell. I'll ask Chase to stand just a moment. Chase is going to preach this morning and we all look forward to that so very much. A few more words about him as we get into our announcements. And now let us worship God. Please join me in the call to worship. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Please stand for our first hymn.
take just a few moments to look at announcements in your bulletins. I ask that you would look at all of the announcements carefully and take part in anything that you see is something of interest to you and the many ministries that we have going on. But first, I would like to recognize that George and Linda have a lot of family with them this morning after a wonderful reception that they had yesterday to celebrate a big anniversary of 50 years of uh, wedded bliss, right? <laughs> and uh, we have uh, Cooper here. Where are you, Cooper? Uh, Cooper is uh, visiting with us from uh, the Art School for Arts and Science. Is it still Arts and just Art School for Arts in Brookhaven? It's a state school that he is uh, now enrolled in so happily and gladly, and I think he will thrive there with their curriculum. So glad to see you. And there are others visiting today. We have some of Chase's family visiting, and so glad to have you this morning as well. Other visitors who might be here because the children are here, but most of you still have come because we worship God together today. And so uh, Chase will be preaching today, and I'm very happy to introduce him again to you. Um, Chase is working with us since the 1st of August in ministry programs in this church, and will be doing so for several months as he pursues uh, ordination and installation uh, in a PCUSA church, and we hope it's ours. So. <laughs> Let us pray as we prepare for confession. Please join in this re responsive prayer. Eternal light, shine into our hearts. Deliver us from evil. Eternal wisdom, scatter the darkness of our ignorance. With God, scatter the darkness of our ignorance. With all our heart and mind and strength, may we seek your face and be brought by your infinite mercy to our holy presence. Let us confess our sin before God and one another. Let us confess together. Merciful, Merciful God, God, we confess, we confess that, that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, Forgive what we have been, help us to mend what we are, and direct what we shall be, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. in a, a position to condemn only Jesus Christ. And Christ came in the world to live for us, to die for us. Christ was raised for us. Christ reigns in power for us and prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. Know that in Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven, and be at peace. Amen. Let us stand to give glory to God.
like those forgiven through Jesus Christ, let us not fail to forgive one another. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with each of you today. And also you. Greet one another with the peace of Christ from your pews. to see all of you today and I'm going to start with a picture because in just a few minutes you are going to see something that looks very much like this what do you think they are doing singing. they're singing that's a little choir and they're all joined together singing and we think they're in church because they seem to be wearing robes and often the choir in church will wear a robe Someone who is in the choir, one of them, also got to lead. How about that? So this little story is not just about singing in church in a little choir, but you'll see we're going to have a beautiful choir singing in just a moment. And they're all young people singing beautiful, beautiful song for you this morning. But sometimes in a song, one person gets to sing a special part, and we call that a solo. Lots of people like to do solos, and so what happens? Well, the ones who don't get to do solos have to wait for another time when it's their turn to do a solo. And all of life really is like that. Sometimes we don't get to choose what we can be or do, what piece of cake we have when we go up to take our piece of cake, whatever it might be, we sometimes take just what happens in that particular moment and that's what happened here so they are all singing and doing a beautiful job and following the leader even though some of them might have wished to be the leader so when you can't be the leader then you do want to cooperate and be a good part of the group and that's certainly something that we know and we learn in church so let's stand together we'll pray in thanks to God for music and for singers and just all the things that Jesus teaches us. So pray with me. Dear God, thank you for today. Thank you for teaching us about singing and about sharing. Thank you for beautiful voices and voices that sing joyfully, and for people who lead. Thank you for Jesus, and all he teaches us. We pray in his name. Amen. Now you're going to sit with Miss Helen and uh, listen to the song, and then you'll go with her to your children's time.
loving God, your word is a light to our feet and a lamp to our path. Your word is glue of the universe, wherein the whole creation coheres. Your word is the address of promise and command by which we live. Your word has come flesh among us, full of grace and truth. We are creatures of your word, and we give thanks for it. For all that we are more, more dazzled that your word is carried, uttered, acted by frail, vulnerable human agents. We ponder and give thanks for those who this day speak your word where it is desperately needed and deeply resisted. We ponder and give thanks for those who this day act your word for newness and peace and justice. We ponder with trepidation that among us you will yet designate such carriers, such speakers, such actors. In our thanks for your word, we pray for courage in the name of the one who emptied himself. Amen. A responsive reading from Isaiah, please join in this reading. Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right. For soon you are who join themselves to the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it and hold fast my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer, that their burnt offerings and their sacrifices be accepted from my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord God, gathers the outcasts to Israel, I will gather others to them besides those already gathered. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, a responsive reading from Psalms. Please join in this reading. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us, that your way may be known upon the earth and your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the people with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, has blessed us. May God continue to bless us, but all the ends of the earth revere him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for our second hymn. It is a most unexpected and undeserved honor and privilege to be 
among you this morning. Please pray with me. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In our reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15, beginning in verse 10. Then he called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person falls into a pit, God's another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. Then he said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that what, what, whatever goes into the mouth enters into the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the mouth come, out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and, sh and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. The word of the Lord. The story from our gospel reading this morning is about people finding and testing their limits. Before 1938, just six short years before the Manhattan Project, a recent small film came out about that, maybe you heard of it. Just six years before the Manhattan Project, in 1938, everybody knew that splitting the atom was beyond the limits of what was possible. The word atom itself comes from a Greek word that means that which cannot be divided. But in December of that year, Chemists Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann were performing experiments in their Berlin lab where they would bombard samples of this strange element, uranium, with streams of neutrons. And to their great confusion and concern, they found themselves going way past the limits of what should have been possible. Because not only did those unsplittable uranium atoms split, they discovered that in the breaking of those unbreakable atoms, small but powerful bits of energy would be released. Neutrons from the broken uranium atoms splitting off, which in turn might just hit other uranium atoms, and so on and so forth, till what might be called, they supposed, a chain reaction could form. On the other side of the border of what was supposed to be possible, there was a world where all those old limits suddenly didn't matter anymore. Jesus, as I guess you might already know, liked to push the limits of what was possible just from time to time. As we've heard over the last few weeks in the previous chapter of Matthew, Jesus fed a few thousand people with what should have been barely enough food for one. He took a stroll and calmed th the waves of uh, a storm on the lake. Jesus is always showing and telling about the boundary breaking kingdom of heaven. God's limit pushing and defying reign where the un 
curable are healed, the untouchable are welcomed, and so much that seems impossible to us turns out to not be so impossible for God. Along the way, of course, Jesus blew through some rules that God's people in those days thought were unbreakable. Now, Jesus didn't break God's rules, mind you, far from it. But Jesus had no problem walking over those homemade rules that some people had attached to God's law. Just before our reading this morning, religious authorities had come to Jesus asking why on earth his disciples thought they had the right to break the tradition of the elders, and eat with unwashed hands. Now, before you think Jesus had a problem with Purell or Dial, this is ritual hand washing that we're talking about. And over time, the requirement in God's law that the Levitical priests wash their hands before making sacrifices, they had expanded that narrow reading to include everyone. Everyone ought to ritually wash their hands before every meal so that every meal could be a sacrifice to God. But like so many of our most sacred traditions, good intentioned or not, Jesus saw that this had become just one more excuse so that some of us could exclude and feel superior to the rest of us. Jesus always saw to the heart of the matter, didn't he? God's heart and ours past those little made-up limits and limitations that we use to excuse ourselves from fully loving God and one another. Jesus said, it's not what goes into your mouth that makes you unclean or clean, right or wrong, in or out. It's what comes out. Because what comes out of your mouth comes from your heart. And as Jesus explains, and we all know too well, no matter how we might tidy up on the outside, those things that come out of here and out of here aren't always so clean, are they? Jesus pushed past the limits of religion and culture to the core truths of who we are and what God requires of us. Jesus called and welcomed all people to experience the love and power of God, no exceptions, especially and even those people that our culture and our religion tells us are far beyond the borders of God's kingdom. In Matthew's gospel alone, he's already called a tax collector to be one of these disciples. He's already healed the son of a Roman centurion who said, I'm not even worthy for you to come in my house. He's already said that foreign pagan cities like Tyre and Sidon might just end up better on Judgment Day than Bethsaida and Chorazin and Capernaum, some of God's people's hometowns. So now Jesus goes up in the direction of those very places, on the borderlands, on the limit of the so-called holy and unholy, the clean and the unclean, the godly and the ungodly, the in and the out. And what happens? A woman comes to him leaping over every limit that was supposed to divide God's people from the rest of the world. She is not only a foreigner from that foreign place, she is a Canaanite. Those ancient enemies of God who are like one of the stock bad guys of the Old Testament. And as if Jesus and his friends weren't already nervous about being in this unholy place, this woman is pleading, screaming for healing for her daughter who is tormented by a demon. Here is the line in the sand. Here is the limit, just asking for Jesus to step across it. And against all our expectations, Jesus silent. Why is Jesus silent in this moment? His silence bothers us. I mean, it bothers me. It bothers his disciples who ask Jesus, just send this woman away. Because Jesus' silence is made all the more unbearable by the continued cries of this woman. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, son of David. And Jesus is silent. It's unlike him, isn't it? It's 
out of sync with how Jesus behaves, even who we believe Jesus to be. In fact, it's the only time in all the Gospels that Jesus is unresponsive at first in the face of a hurting person who comes seeking healing. Whatever Jesus is up to, it sure gets our attention, doesn't it? Like that uncharacteristic lull in the noise when suddenly I, I can't hear my four-year-old bouncing against the walls anymore. Jesus' silence pulls us right to the edge of our seats. And we, we ask, well, then aren't you going to do something? Perhaps. If we can't figure out what Jesus' silence is about, perhaps Jesus' silence is meant to alert us to our own silence. Because good people of God, aren't we sometimes a little silent too? Are we silent when we hear our neighbors crying for mercy? Are we silent in the face of those whose hurts and needs are calling out to us for compassion? When my fellow human being is calling out to me, I am hungry. My child is hungry. I am feeling hopeless. My options are running out. Can you do something, anything? Am I just silent? Or have I even used those good old made-up limits to drown out my uncomfortable silence and the voices of need around me? Well, it's, it's not my job and it's not my problem. And what difference could I make anyway? And then we love this one, don't we? Do they really deserve it? Jesus is silent. And then Jesus names the limit that is supposed to keep him from responding to this woman. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As Israel's Messiah, the promised son of David, Jesus' mission was first to and among God's chosen people, Israel. And as a member of that people, Jesus belonged to the elect family of Abraham. The people that God had singled out to bless and to save. And Jesus had told his disciples those same instructions when he sent them out. Don't go on the roads that lead to the Gentiles. Don't go into any of those Samaritan towns. So when the woman finally comes, throws herself at Jesus' feet, begging, Lord, help me. Jesus puts it crassly and plainly. That limit, that boundary that's supposed to separate God's holy people from everybody else. It's not right to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. Well, if Jesus' silence bother us, his words downright shock us, don't they? He's calling this poor mother a dog. And that's no compliment in the ancient Near Eastern world, no matter how much we like and love dogs. <laughs> Canines get just a handful of references in the Bible, and all of them portray dogs as these unclean, outside, untamed beasts that you wouldn't want to pet, let alone feed or bring to church. Jesus seems to be repeating just one of those kinds of cruel, terrible things that people in his day must have said about those they considered outside the limits of God's people. But perhaps, if we can't figure out why in the world Jesus said that, perhaps Jesus' strange, harsh words might be meant to call to mind the same sorts of things that you and I have said or thought about those people, those people beyond our limits. What labels have we used to say that this man or woman is not worthy of our care or our respect? What names have we dared to attach to this or that child? We never even learned this woman's name in any of the Gospels. Whose names have we never cared to learn? Because we already know what we'll call them, even if only in our hearts, to excuse ourselves from knowing them and loving them. Jesus' silence Jesus' words and Jesus' seeming in action in the face of this desperate woman confuse and confound us. 
This is one of those stories, there's a few of them in our Bibles, that remind you, if, if folks like Matthew had simply made up all this stuff, they could have made it all a little easier to read and believe, couldn't they? But they didn't make it up, did they? They wrote as inspired witnesses to the one who was called Emmanuel, God with us. And Jesus was and is God with us. The king of Israel, who in Matthew's story is first worshipped not by God's people, but by a foreign pagan magi from outside the border of Israel who make that trip just to see him. God with us, the radical revolutionary rabbi who gathered outcasts to be his disciples, fishermen, tax collectors, fools, and taught them that God's blessing is for the poor, the weak, the hungry, the thirsty, the persecuted. God with us, nailed to a cross between two rebels, God's own son suffering, bearing God's people's rejection and sin and death rather than even think about letting go of God's love for his people. God with us, despite every limit that should have kept us from him, despite every exception or excuse that might keep us from receiving or sharing God's love. God with us, in all the ways that we least expect, among the very people that we imagine couldn't be further from God. Yes, Lord. That's true, the Canaanite woman says to Jesus. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the table of their masters. And in that moment, faith splits through that unsplittable atom that is the limits of grace. Faith trusts that God will make exceptions even to our exceptions. Faith knows that even the unbreakable holy limits of religion and culture and politics and anything else can't possibly limit the holy God. Because despite it all, faith falls at the feet of Jesus and cries for mercy. This is Jesus, the promised descendant, the elect descendant of Abraham through whom God would bless not just one people, but all people. The one sent by God to gather, as Isaiah says, the out, to gather to the outcasts more and more people besides those already gathered. And in that moment of faith, when this woman past the limits of grace dares to dream that maybe there just aren't any limits to the grace of God, in that act of faith, a chain reaction begins. The grace of Jesus breaks through the boundary that keeps this woman out, and then it just keeps pushing, bringing healing to her little girl. And today, bringing a boundary-breaking word to us fellow outcasts with her. Friends, what keeps you from counting yourselves in the grace of Jesus? And what on earth is keeping us from counting others in it with us. What limits, what excuses could we possibly have to excuse ourselves from the limitless love of God or to somehow limit those with whom we're supposed to share? I'm not sure. But a funny thing happened to me this week. On a walk through Duncan Park, I bent down to piece, pick up a piece of litter that I, I saw near the jungle gym or the jingle jam as we call it in our household. I bent down to pick up this piece of litter that was there polluting the park only to find this beautiful handmade bracelet. And it was tucked neatly into a little Ziploc bag with a handwritten note and a drawing and it said, I hope this bracelet brightens your day I made it just for you. And you know what I did at first? I put it right back on the ground. 
Because surely I figured that bracelet wasn't meant for me. Surely the person who took the time to make this piece of art and tuck it into that bag and write that note and put it on the playground, surely they had someone else in mind that they hoped to bless that day. But then I thought, why shouldn't it be me? Why would I excuse myself from being blessed and count myself out? Why would I put a limit on something so good and free? May you know today that you are seen and heard. You are counted in the love of God. You are known and loved by the one who has no boundaries or, ex or exceptions. Yes, you are welcome here. And may that same limitless grace push you, force you towards those that God still longs to gather and to heal to those that we have yet to welcome to God's wide open table. Amen. Pray with me. God, thank you for crossing over that which we don't think we can cross over and that which we don't care to cross over. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for the Spirit. Thank you for your boundless love. Help us to hear it, to see it, and to share it. To make no excuses for ourselves or anyone else. That others in these days may give thanks and be surprised by those impossible things that you continue to do. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Stand together as we confess our faith. Let us affirm our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, resurrection of our life and the life everlasting. Amen. I 
majesty, O God, holy and eternal. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray together the prayer that Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Jesus said, Ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. God abounds in love and mercy and welcomes our return. For in Christ, God came to us that we might have abundant life. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it with it. With gladness, let us present the offerings of our life and labor to the Lord. self-indulgence, but through love become servants to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Let us give thanks to God in prayer. Blessed are you, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Remain standing now for our final hymn. 